Imagine you just found out a dear friend has cancer. What on earth do you say? Today I'd like to have a conversation about cancer, so that if you find yourself in that kind of a scenario, you are more prepared to be the best friend possible to that person. I'm a two-year survivor, and I've had the privilege to speak with a number of other warriors about our shared experience. And today I'd like to pull back the curtain a little bit and share some insights from this side, some mine, some from that group, so that if that awful C word does come up, you are more prepared. And chances are, if you haven't had that conversation, it's probably coming soon, because the numbers are scary high. I recently read it's one in eight for my particular flavor. And I want to start with two things for those conversations. That nobody warns you about cancer, and I wish they had me. And the first thing is that cancer isn't this simple concept that you can put a, an easy label on and be done. We talk about heart disease or diabetes or a root canal, like there's this tidy little box that it fits into. But not, co not so with cancer. There are a couple of types of lung cancer, a couple of types of colon cancer, multiple types of breast cancer based on a number of different factors. Which leads to the second thing about cancer. The diagnosis isn't just an event, it's also a process. One really tough visit to the doctor could be followed by my, what might be weeks until you get a really firm sense of what's going on. It may not be until the other side of surgery. Stage and treatment plan can change. There are multiple doctors involved, and test after test after test, which means that it's virtually impossible to get your footing. That rug gets yanked out from under you and the ground does not quit shifting. And while you wait, you fret about your family, and you wonder about whether or not you're going to die. And darn it, life does not have a pause button. There's still work, and bills, and my daughter, and the dog with allergies, and the house cleaning, and the laundry don't stop. And the crazy doesn't stop when you finally make it to treatment, either. Maybe it's chemo, maybe radiation, maybe both. Maybe it's pills, which means hazmat disposal at home. The list of side effects is long and pretty scary, and maybe they change over time. Maybe it just makes you tired, like the folding a basket of laundry makes you feel like you've run a marathon kind of tired. Or maybe the meds to keep you from being sick make it so you can't sleep no matter how tired you are. Or change the way your favorite foods taste. Now they taste like mildew or aluminum foil, and that's not awesome. <laughs> I've talked to some people who never wanted to be a burden or a bother to their children. And what about my husband, who's now carrying the whole load? How did just 12 weeks of treatment some, somehow feel like a geological age? And do I still get to talk about things I want to do five years from now or not? And into the midst of this, now you, my sibling, my friend, my colleague, maybe you heard about my news and you want to check in. Maybe we were talking and it just came up. You're concerned, you want to do something if you can. For better or worse, though, oftentimes when we hear that, that word cancer, the first place we go to is to death. Or maybe that worst image we have of chemo. And we're challenged by living in a society that doesn't do well talking about bad stuff, like life insurance or depression, or sometimes just admitting we're having a tough time. Even in communities of faith, we struggle. We go to that inspirational quote, that sports analogy, that favorite scripture. We try and take the, the edge off somehow, look for that silver lining. But when we're too quick at that, we lose the, that current challenge and the pain and the discomfort in this process. So what can you say or do to be an effective friend? Because remember, the ground is still shifting for me. I can't get my footing. We're in Florida, that hurricane I'm trying to stand in. What can you say or do? Let me start with three th topics. It's probably okay that you can just skip over. And the first one, interestingly enough, is stage. 
And I get that you're trying to understand how serious this thing is or what might happen, but stage one doesn't mean it's easy. And stage four doesn't necessarily mean I'm about to die. Stage is really for the doctor's record keeping and is not a good barometer for how I'm handling it. So since it's not real helpful, let's skip that one. The second thing you can probably skip over is my hair. And I get that you're probably trying to encourage me because we live in an image-obsessed society, after all. Maybe I am afraid to lose my hair. Or maybe that clump that came out in my hand is the worst thing I've experienced and I don't want to talk about it. Or maybe in the middle of that crazy hurricane, the last thing I'm worried about is my hair. I don't have to shave my legs either, so it's not all bad. <laughs> but whether it's irrelevant or difficult, that, that emphasis on image can just feel a little weird, so skip that one too. The third topic you can probably leave off the table for now would be alternative treatments or my diet. And yes, you might have read about this really neat herb or this amazing superfood, or maybe you're worried if I don't change my diet, I won't beat this thing and you want me to live and I appreciate that. But until such time as chocolate really does cure all ills, <laughs> remember that my emotional and mental capacity is pretty taxed right now, and I may not have a whole lot left to defend my own research or my choices. So if instead you make a comment like, there's a ton of stuff online right now in there that keeps me out of that defensive place and gives me options to talk with you to the level that I feel up to it. The conversation gets harder, though, and it's more important for you to be that really great friend when talk of the process comes up. Because much like me, you probably want this thing out and gone before it can go any further. But even if you're frustrated by the process that insurance can sometimes create, or maybe you even wonder if my doctors know what on earth they're doing because they're sending me for one more test, now isn't the time to debate that. These doctors are, generally speaking, wonderful people who hate cancer as much as you and I do. They may have family touched by it. They're probably as frustrated by insurance. They're looking for the least impactful option with the best possible outcome, and I'm asking them every question I possibly can. So if you say something like, I've heard this process can be confusing. Again, it keeps me out of that defensive place, and there's a camaraderie in it. Like you get it at some level and you're walking along with me. And most of the time, that's all I need. But when we're talking about doctors and the process, let me just mention, and, and as a reminder, that in our daily lives, most of us don't actually like talking about our health issues. And cancer opens this really uncomfortable door. And talking about the type of cancer I have, or the treatments, or the surgery, it can get a little odd a little weird or uncomfortable. Many men, for example, may not want to talk about the side effects of prostate cancer. I may not want to tell you it's cervical cancer. If I say it's lung cancer, will you think I deserve it because I smoked? And can I just say as a breast cancer survivor that while I think it is absolutely wonderful we talk about it more from an early detection standpoint, when you bring that down to the personal level and you start to ask if they're going to take the lump or all of it or why not both, Seriously, if you have not at least once bought my dinner, why are we talking so much about my breasts? <laughs> Just go easy. Instead, in those situations, ask things like, do you mind if I ask, do you want to talk about it? Those are gentle and more respectful. And if I don't, it's probably going to come back around. We're just going to catch up about it in between those rain bands. In the meantime, just say, OK, I'm thinking about you. Another alternative is, I'm sorry you're going through this. That's totally acceptable. Because that just acknowledges how crummy this thing is and that you care. Because even when the prognosis is really good, it can still really hurt. And in those impossible storms where the rain just won't stop, knowing that you've got that support means a lot, so much more than you may ever know. And that simple statement is also something I can't argue with. You care, end of sentence. Because conversely, I have no idea how to respond when you say that I'm brave. Brave is running into a burning building on purpose, and I didn't choose this. And I'm very aware of every moment I feel anything 
but brave. When you say that I'm strong, you don't see me at home or in the dark moments when I break down. You might be trying to encourage me by saying, I don't seem sick, but that just discounts the things that you can't see. If you think I'm handling it well, I want to know how much money you have and let's play poker. <laughs> so yeah, if you want to come in it, qualify it like that and say, yeah, I don't know how you feel at home, but that gives me the wiggle room. It's a similar kind of place where you offer prayers for my healing. And trust me, I want to beat this thing too. But specifics about outcome are that tricky place. Because it doesn't always end well. What if I still die? So if instead of or alongside those prayers, you offer prayers for peace in the process or comfort in the challenge, those are promises that I can hang on to and they oftentimes mean so much more. But to be that really wonderful friend, I want to give you one tip that will keep me out of that place for any time for internal dialogue. And it works like this. As a function of our daily lives, we all keep track of things at different levels. Some things involve mental gymnastics. Other things I can answer without any thought at all. I know what I'm doing tomorrow. Next Friday, I've got to think about. So when you ask me that seemingly simple question, what can I do? It's actually anything but simple. Because in order to answer or see what there might be for you, I have to catalog everything that's out there. There's my daughter at school, there's the, the dog and the doctor's appointments and the groceries. And if I ask about this or if I mention that, is that something you can do? Is that something you can help with? And you can see I'm right back in the middle of that storm. So instead, offer something like, could I bring you dinner? Or would you like one of those housekeepers for the weekend? My brain never has to engage to answer that question. <laughs> I would love a maid, but I want to prep my mess first, so let's go with dinner. <laughs> Offer one, or at most two, concrete suggestions. Because when we're talking about the process or treatments, any of that kind of stuff, broad and open-ended is really, really helpful. But if you want to make a suggestion about action, specifics help here. You can do my thinking for me. So if it's dinner, instead of what day works, because again, I've got to keep track of everything for that, suggest, does Tuesday work or is Wednesday better? I've got two days to consider. Instead of what sounds good or what do you like, is Italian OK or do you want that chicken from the store? Because trust me, nothing tastes as good as anything I don't have to think about. But what if neither option works? Despite how it may feel in the moment, it's no big deal. OK, I'll try again sometime. It's like in the normal world. Let's say I'm trying to get together with one of my girlfriends and our schedules don't work out. We just try again sometime. No big deal. And I want to emphasize this point here. The, so, the basic social contracts still hold with cancer. Yeah, I've got cancer. And to a certain extent, I'm trying to find a new normal in this. But I'm still me. I'm still a wife and a mother and a sister and a daughter. And I have a job that I love and things I want to do and books I want to read and places that I want to go. And sometimes I just don't want to think about my cancer or be defined by it. Sometimes if we can just have a conversation and ignore that elephant in the room for a minute, that's a real gift. Just ask if I want to go to the movies, not if I feel up to it. Because let's say that you know, in the normal world again, that I'm dealing with that, oh, darn it, my metabolism's just starting to slow down thing, right? You're not going to ask me about my diet every time you see me. Sometimes being a great friend means not asking. You're not insensitive. Because let's say we get to talking about work or the kids or the weather forecast or that great game the other day. You're going to hear how I'm handling things without having to ask. And you might hear something that you could do for me. Maybe today I'm actually feeling OK. Or maybe today I've got the smile so that I don't get stuck in a bad place. Or maybe today the smile is for you so that you don't feel awkward either. Because cancer can get awkward for both of us. And it can be isolating. So this is my last tip for you. Let me still be a friend to you. Let me hear about your life and what's going on. 
But if we're talking about you and your storms for a bit, because we all have them at some point, don't back up and say, but it's nothing compared to what you're going through. That steals from both of us. You're allowed to have junk. This isn't a competition, and there's no objective standard anyway. And when I get to hear about you and your storms, I still feel useful, and I still feel connected. And our relationships are arguably the most important things in our lives anyway. So when storms come to the people around us, we naturally want to help. And if that storm is cancer, here's what I hope you remember from today. The cancer is a crazy process, and it's different for everyone. So be patient. If you're talking about the process or treatment at that point, just keep it broad and open-ended. But if you do have a, an idea, an action, something you want to do, be specific there. That can help. Help that person think when you can. Most of all, treat them for who they are, not what they've got. And my hope then is you're more prepared to be the best friend possible. And you cannot just mean well, but do well. I thank you.